The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence, with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I'm asking on their behalf, I'm not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Bow your heads with me in prayer, please. Lord, take our minds and think through them. Take my lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus. Take our wills and put them in submission to yours. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, good morning on this seventh Sunday of Easter. And as we continue uh, this journey that we are on together in our world, in our nation, in our communities, uh, as we begin to imagine reopening in six weeks, which, by the way, six times seven, seven days a week, 42, it's almost like a whole period of Lent from today until opening. So you can do it. We've made it this far. Six weeks, and uh, we will get there. But in the midst of this conversation, there is, as some of you may have seen, there are memes on Facebook, the things we don't want to hear as soon as this is all over, you know, together, yet apart, the new normal, all these things that are being used, mostly in commercials, um, are getting to the point where we get it, we understand. Uh, we have evolved our consciousness in this language of protection and separation. We know that when we are out and when we are in church, when we return, we will need masks. We know that we will need to wash and sanitize our hands. We know that we will need social distancing, six feet at least, not only in restaurants and stores, but in church as well. These are protective measures. They're here to protect us in general, and of course, again, those who may most be affected. A lot of this language is protective measures because we don't really know what we don't really know. There are some guesses, there are some theories, there is some science, but it seems to all be a big mess right now. I think one of the largest problems as we talk about all these protective measures is that the language and the battle we are fighting, the day-to-day the -day with this virus, there are some things that kind of, I think, are underlying inherent problems for us. You see, human beings love to think we know everything. Or at least we think we know everything. And yet here we are with this virus. We don't know enough. We don't know, again, what we don't know. New data comes out each day. New theories, new fears, new victories. We just don't know. And underlying that inability to know, I think, is another problem. It's that we seem to be fighting an adversary that we can't even see. You can't see the virus. It's one thing as if this whole thing was a war, perhaps. Even a nuclear war, even a hurricane or tornado. At least you can see what's coming at you. But I think not knowing and not being able to see is frustrating many of us. There is a third level, if you will indulge me as I take us there. Not only do we not really know what we don't know, not only can we not see, but those of you who have been doing any studying of virology, the, the biology of viruses, you may know that uh, there is actually some conjecture, there is some confusion as to 
if viruses are actually even alive. They don't even seem to be actually alive. They are kind of living DNA that kind of moves about and evolves and kills things, but they don't have a brain. So not only do we not know what we don't know, not only are we fighting something we can't see, but we're fighting something that we can't see that's not doing this on purpose. <laughs> are you as frustrated as I am? I think so. The thing is, human beings like to know everything. That's why we have Google, that's why we have schools, that's why we have pride and arrogance and ego. We think we know everything. And more often than not, I would suggest that human beings really, really appreciate it when we can see our adversaries face to face. It gives us some sort of sense of foundation. It gives us an ability to prepare and at least know what's coming at us. And yet here we are. This is why I think it was so helpful today that in our scriptures, Peter talks about this other adversary. And he says this, like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to de uh, devour. This roaring lion. You see, unlike the virus, which we can't see or fully understand, this imagery, this metaphor, I think works. Because most of us, if not all of us, can at least picture a prowling, roaring lion. Personally, and, and, and I've mentioned this in several other sermons, and many of you know I have a wildlife biology undergraduate degree, which I never used, but I did enjoy it uh, my whole life. I've enjoyed just looking at nature and watching nature. Those of you uh, who know in the 70s and 80s, there were all sorts of great PBS nature shows. Nature was actually the show. Um, there was Wild America with Marty Stauffer. These shows where I would just sit there enthralled, watching some guy walk around in the woods and talk about, look at the bear, it's eating berries. Watch this tiger kill the gazelle. And on one level it seemed silly, but I was just enraptured with it, I loved it. I used to, when I was in fourth grade, this is a silly story, I, uh, I took a book out of the library in fourth grade at least six times. It was Wildlife of North America. And I took it home when I was 10, nine years old, and I read it. What is their ecosystem? How many babies are they having? What are they attacking? Where do they live? And I read it over and over. I have no idea why. I just loved studying nature and wildlife. And as I got older, that evolved into a real deep passion, especially for big cats. And if you like cats, you got to love big cats. And there's something about the power and the majesty and the beauty of tigers and lions, and especially snow leopards. I've mentioned this before, and many people know that uh, my dream job was to study snow leopards in Nepal. Never quite got there, though I have been to Nepal. There's something about the beauty and the majesty of the snow leopard. And some of you may remember 10 years ago or so when that, that new technological wonder of TV shows, Planet Earth, came out with all these wonderful new cameras and they were showing the nature and the wildlife in ways people had never seen before. It made Marty Stauffer look like he was in the Stone Ages. And there was a scene in one of those videos of a snow leopard chasing a, a deer of some sort literally on the face of the cliff. It was this prowling, roaring, well, it wasn't roaring, but it was prowling. Snow leopard. And the beauty of it, and the craziness of it, that the deer was running along the side, and so was the snow leopard. And yes, at the end, the snow leopard did get a deer. There is this kind of um, intrigue, I think, at least for me, and, and, and with my background, obviously, but many for us, this predator-prey relationship. Perhaps it's because we are the top of the predator chain. I don't know. Maybe it's something in the, in the mouse and the cat chasing kind of thing, the, the, the cat and the deer. There's something uh, when we watch these shows, when we see these powerful animals attacking and prowling after these prey. And when you watch these, and if you've studied these, you know that generally, more often than not, the, the predators have a way they do it, the way that they go after, the way they prowl, and the prey have a way that they protect themselves and the way they escape. Often the predators, if we're thinking about our metaphor today, the lion, what do they do? They, they crouch very low, they move very slowly. More often than not, their skin color blends in almost perfectly with the grasslands around them. And they do that quite simply so that the prey does not know they are coming. 
so they can't see them. If they, uh, if they could be seen, then what's the point? And so there's camouflage and subterfuge. There's this idea that they want to sneak up on the prey because the closer they are, the less energy they expend and the greater their chance of catching the prey. But while predators have evolved all these abilities to hide and sneak and prowl, the prey also have evolved. Not only have they been taught by their mother and father animals, but they have these instincts inherited. Uh, two that come to mind are, are prairie dogs uh, and some other deer-like animals who stand in groups and their ears. There's always one in the group, right, who's watching. Watching while everybody eats, right? It's a sentry. And you see that they have burrows at certain places and they have chirps that they make to let them know. And they have group size to kind of scare off the predators. And so we see this give and take, this predator-prey relationship, this prowling lion and this seemingly innocent gazelle. And we see this throughout nature again and again. And the beauty and the majesty of it, even though there is the dark and you know, deadly side of it as well, but it is part of nature. And so today when I hear these words, the adversary, the devil, prowling like a roaring lion, I don't think it was a mistake or even a, a shot in the dark for Peter, Peter to mention that. Primarily because Peter understands that most of us, if not all of us, understand the image of a prowling lion going after prey. The prowling lion who is sneakily coming through the grass and camouflaged in the midst of it. And there on the grassland is the, is the little gazelle just walking around, minding its own business, maybe having a little shoot of grass, maybe getting some water. Now, if we take the metaphor to the next level, we have to, to realize two things. One, obviously the, the lion is the devil. Then there's the difficult part. That means that we are the prey. Now, human beings do not like being prey as evidence, of course, that we are at the top of the predator food chain. But in this image, I think it's correct. You see, Peter is taking the metaphor of a lion going after his prey and he's saying there is this other adversary. This is another level of predator and prey relationship. You see, the devil is prowling after us. He wants to devour us because he wants nothing to be godly. He wants nothing to be lovely. He wants nothing to be truthful. Anything that is godly must be destroyed, devoured, broken, and cast aside. And so he attacks those who have anything in that manner. We remember the temptations of Jesus. He knew I better get to him right away. I can't have God actually walking around in human form because I might be in trouble. Well, we know where that worked out. But for each one of us in our faith, walking around with the power of the Holy Spirit in the life of a community, of the church, in our spiritual lives, we now are the prey for the devil. I'm not going to go into the whole crazy and wide and diverse views on who and what the devil is. Let's just assume that there is an adversary and he is prowling after us. And we are the prey. And just like out in the wild, as the predator has sneaky techniques, as they camouflage in, the devil does as well. The devil's not going to just come up to you and be like, hey, I'm the devil. You know what you shouldn't do? You shouldn't believe in God. Although I guess that's possible. More often than not, the devil and evil comes in a way that we don't see. It sneaks up on us. It, it hints at us. It suggests to us. Those of you who have read C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters know all about this. It's not something we see coming, which is obvious in the metaphor of a predator and a prey. And then for the prey out in the field, we have to remember, and Peter does this so well, you have to see where he's doing it in the context of his letter called one of the pastoral letters, he's training and reminding his people, the church, that there is an adversary and how to be prepared. Not unlike some of the animals in the wild whose parents teach them to, to be prepared. Here is the place you run. Here is how you prepare. Here is how you look at. Some of it's instinct. Some of it is taught. But through their lives, they grow in the knowledge and the awareness of the predators who are always around and you never know when they're going to come at you. And so Peter, like the mother or father in the field, is teaching his children and saying, be prepared. 
First, he says, be humble under the hand of God. And this is, this is an Old Testament image of that the hand of God basically says that God is the judge. God is the creator. God has it all in his hand. He's got the whole world in it. Okay. The idea is that in God's hand, as we are humble before him, we are trusting that all is working in his hand for good. And so we begin there. And then he suggests this idea, this casting off of anxieties and burdens, which we all want to do and which is more difficult than not. And in this day and age, at this time, it's very difficult. But the suggestion has, again, predator-prey relationship metaphor in it. Because when we cast off our anxieties, when we cast off our burdens, it does two things. One, it frees our minds from fear and worry, which means we can think straight. And if you take the other end, those fears and those worries, they get us heavy, they bring us down, and it's harder to not only attack the adversary, but to run from the adversary. The clearer our minds are, the more we are released from burden, the more aware we are of an environment, and we can see the adversary coming. And so he says, be disciplined and stay alert. And these words underlying in the, in the tradition of the Greek also mean sober. Sober discipline and sober alertness. This is the prairie dog sitting out in the middle of the grasslands, chirping and watching all day for that, that predator to come. There's a reason why Christ and in Christianity and the life of faith we are called to be sober-minded. Because as soon as we are intoxicated, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or even the passions, guess what we aren't doing? We aren't looking for the adversary. We aren't aware of the adversary. We move slower when the adversary attacks. And so we are called to be sober-minded, but also to discipline. This discipline is like the training in the field for the prey. It is the same in the church. We have our spiritual disciplines, study, prayer, worship. The more that we do them, the more we grow in them, the stronger we become, the more the instinct, the memory, the muscle memory takes over so that when the adversary comes, we are prepared. Like that rabbit or that gazelle, we can go and the instincts come in. And the strength of our souls, the strength of our hearts, the endurance which God has filled us with through the power of his Holy Spirit takes us forward away from the adversary. Of course, Peter also reminds us all this is founded on our faith. That through our faith, we begin to come humbly under the hand of God. That through our faith, we are unable to trust God and cast our anxieties on Him. And of course, through faith and our spiritual life, our walk with Jesus, we become disciplined and hopefully sober-minded. All of this, again, in the midst of the world we are in, where we are locked down and quarantined and worried and in our houses, where the devil now not only is prowling sneakily, but he's just coming up and he's knocking on the door. He wants to devour us. He wants to destroy us and take us home to sin and death away from God. And Peter says, my brothers and sisters, be humble under the hand of God. Trust that God is with you. Trust that God is taking your anxieties from you. Stay disciplined. Stay sober-minded. Know that the adversary is out there and he is coming for you, but know that I have prepared you. And he says this at the end so beautifully that through the ups and downs and even through the suffering, through each time that the predator comes after us, each time we have to run through the grasslands, each time we have to know where those trees and those rocks and those birds are, what happens? We get stronger. We're more assured of our footing. We know what to look for and how to respond. And he says, you will be restored. You will be strengthened. You will be established. You will be supported by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the community of people in faith who surround you. You're not alone. You're God's chosen people in Jesus Christ by the blood of the cross. In your faith, you have been given the Holy Spirit and a community in which to protect one another given the strength of the Holy Spirit to stand up in humble faith. And now, as this time begins to evolve, maintain that spiritual discipline. Study, pray, worship, even at home until we can be together again. Love your neighbor. Reduce your anger and your anxiety and your fear and worry. Center yourself in Jesus Christ. Know that the devil, the adversary, is here. He is coming at us. But know that God has won the victory and has prepared us to evade him, to fight him, and to take us home to him face to face one day in his kingdom.
To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.